I hope you enjoy. Uh, hope you all enjoy the poster sessions and the coffee breaks. Now we are going to have very five nice spotlight speakers. So first, let's welcome Professor David Fridovich Kale, who is from UT Austin. Yeah, please take away. All right. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, really, really uh, happy to be here. Um, well, I guess I'm always here, here. But uh, anyway, <laughs> happy to be here uh, and talk with you all about uh, what's going on in in my group. So um, I started here back in August. Um, uh, our group tends to uh, focus on control theory as applied to um, lots of different uh, multi-agent problems. So generally multi-agent problems. So what I'll tell you about today is recent work we've been doing in kind of uh, efficient solutions for uh, non-cooperative games that describe those types of problems and also some connections to uh, efficient learning techniques um, in those games. So when I talk about there we go, delay. Yeah, when I talk about uh, non-cooperative situations, multi-agent situations, there's lots of different things that I want to have in mind. Um, so the the most natural one for me to think about. So I'll suggest that you all try to think about it as well as traffic. So when you're thinking about driving in traffic, you're thinking about um, wanting to you know accomplish a particular objective typically i want to you know make a right turn in two blocks or i want to um, make sure i slow down from the stoplight whatever it may be but every other car on the road probably has a similar um, idea of what they want and those objectives can be in conflict over time so game theory is the the language for mathematically describing these types of situations lots of other application areas that i'm you know not really going to dwell too much on in this talk but, but um, you know, for whatever floats your boat, if you like power systems, that's a good application area. If you like transportation grids, that's another good application area. So what we'll talk through today are just the mathematical basics of what games are and specifically dynamic games that are played over time. So I wanna make sure everyone's got a sort of similar footing. Um, talk through some modern solution techniques for these games. And then I'll give a little vignette towards the last few minutes of uh, how to talk about learning meaningfully in these types of situations. So if you've seen games before, uh, probably you saw static games. Uh, at least that's the first setting that uh, most of us learn about. So Prisoner's Dilemma, Tic-Tac-Toe, not Tic-Tac-Toe, uh, Prisoner's Dilemma, Rock, Paper, Scissors, games like this. If you play once, um, you make a, a decision of what your uh, action will be. Um, everybody does the same thing, and you see what happens. Uh, every player can have a different idea of what happens. So I've kind of written that down as this function j. The vector u is the kind of concatenation of everybody's uh, actions. So um, whenever you talk about a game, there's different types of solutions or kind of important points in the strategy space that we might care about. Throughout this talk, we'll, we'll use the simplest one, which is a Nash uh, point, Nash equilibrium point. Um, and that's uh, kind of akin to an optimum point in an optimization problem. So where uh, everybody is unilaterally uh, very happy with their solution, fixing everybody else's actions. But in robotics and Control theory, we tend to care about systems that evolve over time. So uh, time plays a really key role. And uh, in game theory, the way to express this is in the language of a dynamic game. So here, uh, I've kind of rewritten the objectives of every player to depend upon the state of the game X that's evolving over time, actions that players take over time. So I've subscripted with time. So we'll use this notation throughout. And we can still talk meaningfully about equilibrium concepts like Nash uh, in this type of setting. But once we talk about dynamics uh, and time, we need to start introducing a few other subtleties. So we need to introduce things like rules. Okay, if you play chess, there's clear rules to the game. Um, if you're talking about the physics of cars on the road, there's clear uh, rules that govern how cars can move. Um, if, if, if they accelerate a certain amount at some time, they can't be going faster than a certain amount of elevators. So rules, dynamics govern the evolution of state over time. Um, and a very subtle piece, at least to me, is uh, what information is available to each player at each time. And if you kind of make different assumptions about what players get to see when they make decisions, this really changes the character of an equilibrium. So there's some really, you know, real subtlety in defining these things. But once we've defined a game, so for example, to model traffic, um, we're start, you know, we're left with the question of how do we solve it. And uh, so some work that um, our group has been doing over the last, well, so when I was a PhD student and continuing here, we've been doing the last few years, has been 
coming up with efficient techniques to solve these games. Um, the character D solutions, we tend to think about them, uh, a game as a set of coupled optimization problems, where what we do is think about uh, what the optimality criteria are for every player simultaneously. So if you do that, um, you sort of start writing down KPT conditions and just follow your nodes for a while, and you're left with a root climbing problem. And so modern solution techniques that we and others have developed essentially boil down to finding efficient ways to find roots of first order conditions um, that are coupled between all of the players. So if you do this, you know, you basically can boil the problem down to something that looks a little bit like Newton's method if you're familiar with uh, root finding techniques. And the, the kind of cool thing here is that uh, we can show that each step in these iterative algorithms boils down to a very efficient recursive computation that, you know, for folks who have seen uh, kind of linear quadratic regulation, things like this, uh, looks a lot like that. So uh, if you mix in a few details from optimization, you're left with a, kind of an algorithm that is iterative and looks like the diagram I've shown on the right, which boils down to repeatedly solving games which are simpler and have closed form solutions. So we've shown that these are efficient real-time algorithms, tested them at scale on you know, Boeing test aircraft, for example. And um, so, so this is pretty much the state of the art in solving mathematical games of this variety. So what I want to talk about is um, now that we have these techniques for solving games in real time, this opens up a, a huge world of other opportunities for us to study uh, the interactions of non-cooperative agents in, in real life. So what I want, that, that's kind of going to be a focus the next couple minutes. Um, one thing that I've judiciously ignored so far, that's going to be the kind of basis for the, the next part of the talk, is that Nash equilibria don't always exist. This is something extremely well known in the literature. Um, you know, you just got to look at rock, paper, scissors to see this. So if you think about rock, paper, scissors, think about if you played, you know, rock, let's say, what would your opponent like to play? You'd probably play scissors. Um, if, you know, so, so you can kind of start to go around in a circle, and this is not going to have a, a pure Nash equilibrium. But what's very well known um, is that mixed Nash uh, do exist. So you can see um, this kind of non-existence of pure Nash, existence of mixed Nash. I'll explain what I mean by that in real examples, too. So you can see that, for example, in the pursuit of Asian game. So something like uh, playing tag or uh, you know, capture the flag, something like this, classic examples of game theory. And so here, what, what I'm showing is on the right, uh, like a pursuit evasion game where red wants to catch blue. And I'm showing just one candidate solution point uh, where they've each chosen to follow some trajectory over the next couple of seconds. And what's happening is, you know, this is probably not in equilibrium because the blue player would like to uh, not get caught. So they're not happy. So this is not an optimal point for them. So the point, the, the point is these non-existence issues do naturally appear in real interesting ways, uh, continuous dynamics, etc. Um, Nash, I said, uh, can exist if we make a slight modification to what we mean by strategy. And this is what people mean when they say mixed Nash. So when you talk about a mixed Nash, say in rock, paper, scissors, you're talking about randomizing your choice between rock, paper, and scissors. So you're choosing uh, a distribution. You're choosing to play from a probability distribution. And you can see the same thing happen in that pursuit of Asian game that I was illustrating before. If each player has, say, two trajectories that they can choose uh, randomly between, there does exist uh, a Nash equilibrium in that more complicated space. So what we've been able to do is essentially characterize equilibria in games that are mix that, that are uh, kind of lifting the strategy space to include both pure and mixed Nash equilibria and solve. Uh, learn to solve pursuit of Asian games in those sorts of things. So I'm essentially uh, waving hands vigorously at the math, so I'm assuming that people are reading very quickly in this uh, limited time here. But, uh, but basically what's boiling down is that we're, we're allowing players to choose trajectories, choose multiple discrete options, think of these like motion primitives or something like that, but also choose with what probability will they follow each option and solve a game in this lifted context. And this actually, uh, we've shown that this uh, dramatically outperforms other notions of equilibrium. So um, there's a, some mathematical subtlety here of how we actually solve these games, but for the sake of time, we'll neglect this. And the TLDR is that 
We can characterize the equilibria and show that the equilibrium points are different than those that existed before. We can show that they can represent stronger policies, stronger solutions than were available before. We can show that we can train, learn to play in these strategy spaces uh, efficiently. Uh, you know, each, it's an iterative algorithm that takes milliseconds per iteration, so quite fast. And we can show that these uh, policies outperform uh, uh, existing notions of uh, of, of strategy spaces. So the message, take home message is um, pure Nash don't always exist, but with these computational tools we've been developing, we can solve in more complicated spaces in uh, quite efficiently. So that's that's all I got. I'd love to take any questions uh, just after the, the session. Well, thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, yeah, so next we will, we're going to have Professor Robert Ambrose from Texas a and Hi, I'm Rob Ambrose. Uh, thank you for inviting us to this. Uh, I'm hopeful that uh, this will be maybe the first of others, and I uh, would like maybe to get together some of the other sites, figure out, maybe plan out the next two or three of these to build some momentum. And I, I also appreciate what we're seeing here at UT. Where we've got faculty from different departments and even different schools uh, within the same university working together, and that might be a good example for the larger region. Uh, so thank you. Uh, I'm working on some, some new initiatives at, uh, at Texas A&M, uh, having retired from NASA, uh, and I'm hopeful that these will be new initiatives that will help the region, and I'd like to uh, engage you on some of those thoughts. Uh, but at the same time, I want to have a fun project on the side. So if you look back at um, what I, I did at NASA where I led the robotics program, um, there are a number of robots that I um, didn't get to build yet, and I still would like to go after. And so I'm going to have some fun projects on the side, and I want to tell you about uh, one of them here. Uh, so we built, let's see how this plays. So we built a robot in 03 that uh, was very unusual. Um, and uh, there was just some things about it that caught my eye, and I decided that I really wanted to um, come back to it. Uh, that's kind of unusual. Uh, I mean, how does that work? Is there like a robot schnauzer in there running around? Um, kind of unusual, uh, a little choppy with the video, sorry. I think this was shot on VHS. Um, you see my student, Lyndon Bridgewater, he was a, a senior at U of H. Uh, you might see me back when I had a red beard walk by. Um, how does that thing work? Is there a gyroscope? That's probably better than the schnauzer. Um, how else might that work? And look how it's soft. It's compliant. Uh, in this case, it might have been a little too soft. You see some patches on the ball. Um, very low ground pressure, less than maybe 0.2 PSI. So this could drive on very soft fluid even soils. Um, you see it has a lot of weird dynamics and bouncing. And in, in hindsight, um, my, my student's trying to drive it open loop and it's just, you, you can't do that. So what I needed to do and I knew I needed to do it was to give him an IMU. And I had an IMU. We just built a set of jet packs for the astronauts and I had a spare and it was only $400,000. And it only, and I had one spare and it was a 16 month lead item. I just couldn't give these students my, my spare IMU. So I said to myself, you know, it's never going to meet its potential without an IMU. It'd be kind of like trying to fly a drone without an IMU. I mean, it's just, that's the way they used to fly model helicopters. It took a lot of skill, actually. Um, so it needed an IMU, and, I, and, the, and the, the technology was just not there yet. Um, but I, I, I had a feeling that there were some important things about this machine, and I would like to come back to it. Um, someday, I just had a feeling that the component technology would come down in price and that I would be able to come back at this. So I kind of stuck a pin in this one. So like, I'm going to come back to this someday. And um, uh, this summer is going to be that day. So uh, Lyndon, great young man, he's now the, uh, the deputy project manager for the Viper rover that's going to the moon in 2023. That's kind of how he got started in robotics. I'm very proud of him. All right, let's see. That's how it actually works, and I'm not going to give it away. Um, uh, well, you want to see it? 
It's actually a pipe with a two degree of freedom pendulum. And one degree of freedom can go continuously forever. That's driving direction. And the other one leans left and right. So it's really so it's only two motors. Very simple. So I'd given him some design requirements and I was stuck on the number 20 apparently. Um, so I said it needs to be able to go uh, 20 kilometers an hour, which for a 20 kilogram robot is really fast. In terms of like specific speed, that's, that's unusual. And then I said it needed to have a 20 kilometer range, which energetically is enormous. And then uh, I said, I'd like it to go over a 20, 20 centimeter step was like an eight inch curb and, and drive up a 20 degree slope. And for the first ball prototype, it, it didn't meet most of those objectives. Um, it definitely was fast and it, it was underweight. So check, check. Um, I'm pretty sure it could drive 20 kilometers an hour, uh, 20 kilometers in range. It was just so out of control. We couldn't drive it to be able to test that, but I'm pretty sure it did it. It could have done it, um, but clearly it had some major deficiencies and it absolutely did not meet the, the step and slope performance for a number of reasons in the kind of the parametric design of it. So the real deficiencies were this unstable driving. It needed a closed loop gyro IMU kind of controller uh, for both driving and steering. Um, and then the ball popped really easily. You know, that ball was aisle four at Toys R Us. Um, and it was too low a pressure. We needed a higher pressure and um, very hard to assemble. It was kind of a ship in a bottle, kind of a problem. So there were some challenges there. Um, but the superlatives, wow, it was so fast and light. And um, at ultra low ground pressure, that's very unusual uh, to be able to operate at such low pressure. And I was thinking the moon, um, which has you know, soft soils. Uh, when it inflates, it does a four to one volume change, which is really important to NASA. So you could ship it small and then it jiffy pops into a big, you know, big robot. Um, and boy, it can take a beating unless you pop it. But you know, blunt trauma, it, it handles it. That's a ball. Uh, so applications, it's got, you know, that pipe is a tubular payload bay. And, you know, NASA, we have a lot of tubular payloads. Um, so uh, working on soft soils, and I've never, I've never worked with a robot that would tolerate dust and thermal as well as this. It's basically a, a thermos. So it could really handle an extreme environment. It has no real openings to get stuff in it. So uh, there's, you know, hundreds of years of people building balls. And I mean motorized balls. There are lots of different kind of kinematic taxonomies of how to make a ball move. And some of them are, are really silly, but others are, are pretty good. Um, and, you know, we're, we're one of those. And then um, there's some really interesting research questions here. And when you have a new kind of morphology of a machine, it, it tends to open things up and, uh, you know, being able to control the pressure and adjust the dynamics of the bouncing is really exciting. So we're, we're definitely doing that. But look at that second one. Turns out there is no aerodynamic data for a sphere rolling in a non-slip condition on a plane. There's a sphere in, in free air. There's a sphere spinning in free air. But with a non-slip condition up against a planar surface, there is no aerodynamic data. And I now have a runway at AM outside my high bay, and I'm going to run this thing. And I'm going to get some aerodynamic data. I'm really excited about that. The, the students are going to have fun with it. Uh, there's going to be the Magnus effect. It'll push the ball to the ground. And it's, it's going to be a, a really interesting uh, series of experiments. The gyro and the inertial control, especially when it bounces and comes off the ground, it has everything it needs to be able to stay straight. So um, I'm going to save some time for questions. And I just want to leave with this thought. This is our, my students' motto for the, for the, for the project. Uh, be the ball. And we're going to have fun with it, and I'm really excited about it. And uh, we're going to be doing some much bigger things you know, the, for the future of robotics in the, the Texas region. Uh, but we're going to have some fun, too. And uh, with that, um, any questions? And I want to say a hi to Professor Al Mock, who was on my PhD committee when I was here at, at UT Austin. I think you were on my wife's PhD committee, too. So, uh, hi, Professor Ma. <laughs> he remembers me when I didn't even have a beard. So, so questions? What's the, uh, you know, the, the, the 
kind of the, the wear and tear of these kind of devices, right? Yes. Their li lifespan, right? Uh, yes. What kind of uh, is rolling in two directions, right? So right. is that is that so, could, could it match a, a wheel of a car at some point or something? So, so a wheel is amazingly tough. If you think of, and it took a hundred years. If you, if you think back to a uh, hundred years ago, cars were popping tires. They were you, they had like four spare tires on the back of their their car when they'd go across country. And they were constantly repairing them and fixing them, and it was a problem. But we were, we've gotten to today, you know, the pneumatic tire is just a marvel of simplicity and ruggedness, and takes a beating. Um, but you still carry a spare. Um, I'm thinking this is so cheap, you know, it, it drives till it pops, and then you're, you know, deploy your sensors and you know, end of life. But um, I, I think uh, you know, clearly the little rubber ball we bought at Toys R Us was totally wrong. Um, and uh, so, other, other, anything else? Uh, okay. Ah, ah, we should talk. And yeah. uh, I'm just wondering, do you need any kind of uh, so, uh, touch? <laughs> so let's talk. Okay. Um, and we have total control of the pressure. The design of the robot can adjust its pressure. But, uh, oh, I'm, ta I'm talking sensor. about the uh, pressure yeah. sensors mounted on I, I, I got, the outer surface and uh, providing per perceptions. Let's, and let's talk. Wonderful. All right? Yeah, thank you. I'm happy to introduce Professor uh, Yu Xiang. And uh, he's, uh, yeah, so from UT Dallas, and please take away. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Yu Xiang. I'm a seasoned professor from the U UT Dallas. And today we're going to talk about closed loop 60s or body grasping of unseen objects. So the first question I want to ask is why is the body grasping challenging? We can take a look at the following example, right? We can have this as a boss, pick up this mug on the table, then it seems like the grasping is really soft. But the problem becomes much more challenging if we consider there are many different mugs the bot need to pick up, right? The mug in the shelf, in the clutter table, in a bin. And we also need to consider task diversity. The robot not just need to pick up a mug, but also use a mug to do some tasks, right? Depending on the task is making tea or coffee or cleaning, the grasping should be different. So the combination of environment diversity and the task diversity really makes the problem really challenging. So in order to tackle these challenges, I believe the perception, planning, and control loop is really uh, critical. Here we have these robots that want to do some tasks in the real world. So first of all, the robot need to perceive, to understand what's going on in the real world. In the example of using marks, the robot needs to recognize all the different marks. And the, after that, the robot needs to use the perceived information to do some planning. And this planning depends on the task. For example, if the task is making tea or coffee or cleaning, the plan should be different. So following after that, the robot needs to apply control to execute the generated plan, right? And this action will change the word, so the word change. Then we need to have this closed loop. The robot should consistently perceive, plan, act in the real world. And more importantly, I believe learning, oh, sorry. Uh, learning is playing a very important role here because robots need to learn various skills in perception, planning, and even control. But today, let's focus on the task on 60 robotic grasping. And 60 means that the robots need to grasp in different orientation and location. This is in contrast to top-down grasping, where the robots just need to go down and grasp objects. So in the traditional way of a model-based 60 grasping, Right? Uh, in perception, we can tackle this problem called a 60 object post estimation, where we use a camera to estimate the 3D location and 3D translation of the objects. And then we can set up a planning scene for motion planning. So here you can see you can detect these objects and the robots can plan trajectory for grasping. And after that, we can apply, for example, place and control to enable the robots to follow the plan trajectory and eventually grasp these objects. Right? But the drawback of model based approach is first, we need to have a 3D model of these objects. And this is a, not a trivial task to obtain 3D models of all these objects. And also, the execution here is open loop, meaning that once the plan is generated, the robot just executes the plan to the end. There's no feedback or perception of the planning during a loop. And open loop is prone to errors in perception or even in planning. So uh, recently, people are focusing on the problem of how to grasp unseen objects. Right? Previously, we needed to have 3D model, but in this case, uh, as for perception, we can have unseen object instance segmentation. That means this approach can segment unseen objects. These objects are not seen during training, but the algorithm can still segment. If we have an RGBD camera for each segmented object, we can have a point cloud. Then there are some approach, they can plan grasps. 
from the partially observed point clouds. Once the grasp is planned, then we can also plan trajectory to reach one of the grasp, and finally the robots can grasp objects. But again, in this pipeline, the problem is, uh, is open-loop execution. There's no replanning or perception during the execution, and this can cause a problem again. So in Coral last year, we proposed this approach called uh, uh, try to learn a closed-loop control policy for safety grasping. Here, our goal is to learn this policy that's uh, represented by a deep neural network and take a state as input and output as an action. Our state representation is based on the segmented point cloud objects. In this example, we can segment this t-shirt and get the point cloud of the t-shirt, and this is our state representation. But for the action, that's the relative 3D translation and 3D rotation of the grapper. And uh, after that, once the action is applied, uh, the state will change because this camera is on the grapper. Right, the camera will move to a new location and get a new image. So from this example, you can see the robot is following this green grapper. That indicates the next location the robot needs to take. And eventually, the robots can grasp this T-shirt on the table. And this is a closed loop uh, control policy for 60 grasping. So we can see uh, we use unsingable instance extension for perception, and the policy is used for control. You may wonder there's no planning that's true, because this policy basically encodes all the plans. The robot just needs to uh, follow this policy for grasping. Right? In order to learn this policy, we combine uh, imitation learning and reinforcement learning. We can use a, a motion planner as expert demonstration. So we set up a planning thing in hybrid here. Then we can generate a lot of trajectories of this robot grasping these different objects. And this can be used to learn the policy. So here's a demonstration on uh, the robots can grasp various objects using this trend policy. But the policy is purely trained in simulation, but it still works in the real world. One main reason is because we use the segmented point cloud of objects, and that is uh, better for the sim to real transfer. So on the right, you can see the camera image from the robots, and these yellow points indicate the segmented point cloud of the objects. And these objects have never been seen during training, because we're just trained on simulation with some 3 shapes, but robots can still grasp the objects. And because this is a closed loop policy, right, we can also apply this policy to human robot handover. So in this example, uh, the task is to hand an object to the robot and the robot needs to pick it. So during handover, we also move around because it's a closed loop control, the robots can follow the objects, right? So what's actually happening here is uh, there's a perception system that can estimate the human pose. All these red dot indicate the human body joints. So we can localize the human hand, right? Then after that, we can segment the point cloud of the object in hand, and these green points are feed into the policy to compute the control action for grasping. Uh, here are two more examples of a uh, handover. So we can move around the objects, but the robot can follow. Okay. So uh, very recently in ICRA, uh, or IAO this year, we extended this policy to a uh, cluttered thing grasping. Uh, we have a hierarchical policy where the policy first generates a plan. The plan is represented in a latent space, but then condition on the generated plan, there's a low level policy that can generate action to control robots. So we can do this uh, closed loop grasping in for cluttered thing as well. And this paper will be presented in ECRA, so I'll talk to you there too. Uh, so lastly, I would like to take this opportunity to introduce my lab, lab because I just joined UT Labs last year. Uh, my lab is called Intelligent Robotics and Vision Lab. Our vision for robotics is we want to enable robots to learn skills. This can consist of skills in perception, planning, control, and learning. And we wish these skills to be generalizable and shareable. And generalizable means that these skills should be able to use in various environments, in various tasks, not just for a single task or single environments. And shareable means we want to share the skills for different robots. All the robots should be able to use the skills once we learn. In the lab, we also build a robotic system that deploys this uh, learned skills so we can test the system, the robot in the real world. And hopefully during execution of the skills, right, the robots can also continuously improve the skills and eventually to become much more better. So uh, yeah, I think I finished a little bit earlier, but that's all the students in my lab. We have several PhD students, master students, undergrad students working with me. And I'm happy to talk to all of you and uh, do some collaboration and on this uh, very exciting robotic field. Thank you. Can oh, I have some questions? Yeah, we have some two minutes left for the 10 minutes session, so question. Because of lack 
have a touch perception. <laughs> yes. Uh, basically, Talk we just. To me. <laughs> yeah, well, there's no touch sensor on the robot gripper. We just apply a, fi a, a fixed force. That's why it uh, squares the uh, object. It's interesting to combine touch sensing as well. Um, how do you, how do you, in the, in the robot handoff, how were you making sure that he didn't grab his hand or that his fingers weren't pinched in the process when handing the object off? Right, that's a good question. The robot doesn't know where's the hand, but we segment the point clouds of the objects and then just try to grasp the object. But in most cases, because a human try to collaborate, right, you handle the objects in a way where the robot won't grasp you. <laughs> so, but it's interesting to see, uh, try to avoid, sometimes it's made, uh, move a little bit further, so that may human may be af afraid of that. So it's an interesting thing to, to study as well. Thank you. Yeah, yeah next has Nick Fay is from with the Austin Mechanical Engineering. There you go. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. So um, thank you, uh, UK and, and Jody for the invitation to present uh, this year. So um, very excited to be a relatively new faculty at University of Texas at Austin and Mechanical Engineering and the Texas Robotics um, Center. Um, there's lots of acronyms we're going to here today from different lab names. Um, ours is the SOM lab, so we study systems that augment human mechanics. Um, I thought I would be presenting after the Mahi lab. I don't know if Marcy presented early. I know we'll hear from the arts lab later. There's the Bureau lab here. There's lots of acronyms. And um, allow me to first um, put the Texas in this um, Texas Robotics Symposium. So uh, the reason I chose that is I actually grew up not far from here. A small town called um, Grumbles, Texas. So, grew up on a farm, some stock farm. That's my mom's maiden name. Uh, we've got all the components of a good country song here. We've got the cattle, the uh, field, the sky, the grass. Missing a, we have my truck. Actually, this is the, the second truck I've ever owned. I'm missing the dog, I guess. But, uh, you know, this is um, a little bit of a frame of reference here where um, some of my work and interest in mechanics and engineering started. Uh, working on farm equipment, factories, and sensors and things of that nature. So I came here for my uh, bachelor's and uh, master's and PhD in mechanical engineering, studying first neuromuscular biomechanics, um, getting into some physical human machine interaction, more from the dynamics perspective, and started as a postdoc in Chicago at Northwestern's uh, University in uh, Shirley Ryan Ability Lab, where we really delved into um, but I've considered more robotics fields, so my electric control, some of my graphic control, and some um, some forms of machine learning. And we study typically prosthetics and orthotics um, interventions for people with limb loss, and we focus primarily on the lower extremity. So this field uh, is often considered to be bionics. So um, if you think about, for example, a transfemoral amputation, a person with a transfemoral amputation, a, a mechanical device that's supposed to be intended to replace Lost biological function. Sure. Sure. Um, that's a lot to ask of a mechanical system to have an appropriate sort of interface to the user physical uh, physical interface, but also an interface where you can sort of pull information and, and interpret that information about someone's intentions. You would want to recognize in advance what what someone would like to do. Um, and then even if you knew what someone would like to do, how do you uh, deliver that within a control system in a, in a biomechanically appropriate way? That's difficult to do because most of that depends on the environment someone is in. So whether they're on level ground or stairs or in an unknown environment or something that they know very well. And even if you did all of that correctly, you know, the way that a person, this super important gray person behind this uh, complicated system, um, the value that they place on um, mechanical, biomechanical objectives is really specific to them and the way that they move. And so you can kind of over-engineer these devices without actually not considering what a user may, may want. So I would say the first bionic leg here, this is a um, postdoctoral work with Levi Hargrove and, and Todd Kaiken, who were the first to really tie the, the neuromuscular system of a person to the control system of a motorized lower extremity prosthesis. And this system was uh, we published in 2015, so it's been around a while, but it's still one of the best examples of a system that responds to someone's intention. It predicts at every toe off and heel strike, the next terrain adjusts its control system accordingly. And even during seated position, um, seated um, postures, first people can reposition their device. And, and, and to do this, we interpret um, myoelectric signals and mechanical signals that are embedded uh, within the device. 
myoelectric signals from, from the person's device, uh, from the person's leg. So if we compare that then to maybe an, an outside of the lab um, environment, so this is a, a coalition that I helped to start in the DFW area during my first faculty position called the Adaptive Sports Co Coalition. This is a US Olympic amputee soccer athlete uh, shown in the top uh, on the left here. Um, this is amputee soccer in uh, adaptive sports competition at an Olympic level. What do you notice? Where are the prosthetic devices? You think these people need, need crutches to walk normally? No, actually the rules of the adapted sport are you have to use the crutches. You can't kick the soccer ball with your residual limb. That, that's against the rules. And so what, what, one of the reasons people do that or these rules are in place is to level the playing field. Right? Every person has a different prosthesis. But another sort of, I think, a more telling example is that you know, these devices just really aren't that great at functioning in real world scenarios outside of the lab. And recreation is one example in the community and the workplace are others. Um, and so another sport here is floor, floor volleyball. We have to stay on the floor right, um, in order to just totally eliminate your lower extremity. Um, this, is, this is one of the, you know, the most common adaptive sport is wheelchair basketball that you're probably familiar with. So I think there's a really you know, huge opportunity here to sort of reshape what it is that prosthetic devices can do, should do, uh, using uh, advanced robotics. So our lab really um, focuses on a few core challenges in, in related to ambulation. One is that ambulation is not discrete, it's continuous time, continuous terrain. There's unknown and known scenarios that the devices need to um, operate in, um, and that humans themselves are specific in the way that they move. Everybody has individualized gait patterns, their own intentions and value they place on certain things, um, but their shape too, right? If you think about putting a prosthesis on someone, um, that can be very personalized. So for the last time that I have here, four minutes, it looks like I'll talk about a few quick student projects. And so one is funded by the NRI 2.0 program um, with a recent graduate from the lab, Caitlin Raby, um, and the University of Utah, where we looked at different forms of muscle-based sensing called sonomyographic sensing to inform how a motorized prosthesis should should behave. And so these are signals of your quadriceps muscles imaging transverse across multiple quadriceps during a weight bearing, sort of going up and down stairs and ramps um, and on a treadmill. And these oscillations are what happen from heel strike to heel strike during gait. We can look at these signals, the intensities of these images, their, their temporal nature, the information that's from superficial muscle all the way down to deep, which is shown here. And we can predict, for example, we could log, because ambulation is cyclic, we could log these signals during the stance phase of walking and predict what the swing phase kinematic should be on multiple terrains, predicting future trajectories. On the other hand, we could, we could log these data during the swing phase and predict future torques that, um, torque that are required within the device or joint moments during the next um, stance phase. And so we could use this for motion planning and we'll demonstrate this uh, in an ICRA presentation this year. Um, and the second area is that really looks at the physical interface between prosthetic devices or, or robotic systems, wearable robots, and the human itself. And the, the way that that interface is defined and, and can be optimized. And so this is a new student in the lab, Marissa Piritano, uh, a, a future graduate who will be graduating in May, and some local partners that we're trying to really get this um, project you know, going and, and funded through primarily the, the DOD. And so for this, we're looking at the transfemoral residual limb itself and how different technologies interact with it. Because even if you had a robotic system that was really amazing, if you had a really sloppy connection or a suboptimal connection to the person, that can really constrain or even enable, you know, really enable if you had a great interface, what someone wants to do. Um, I'm just going to kind of skip ahead a little bit. So we know that local properties of the limb itself can change the way that someone does steady movements, but also transient movements. So this is kind of a bird's eye view of the center of mass trajectory during a timed quick stepping task. And we show that when people, you can actually reshape the soft tissue composition of someone's limb to improve their mechanics. Not only the local properties of the limb, but the way that someone controls a prosthetic device. And so what we're doing now is to really help inform in this area, standard of care, surgical planning. So these are all patients who have ex excess, excessive soft tissue within their residual limb, and they're in pre-op. So this is a plastic surgeon sort of plan for what that surgery should be in terms of removing soft tissue. So what we are doing is to help guide that um, with an optimization framework to basically present based on med medical imaging, mechanical modeling, 
what are some optimal areas on that limb that should be um, should be there, or suboptimal sub regions of the limb that should be removed. And so these are some things we've demonstrated on uh, a couple of patients. And I'm acknowledging here uh, a local partner in Texas, uh, Yasin Dyer, uh, who's um, vice chair of, of orthopedic surgery and physical medicine rehabilitation, and um, and obviously the students work. And the last quick area I'll, I'll highlight are personalizable exosuits and continuous terrain. So this is Ross Newman's work. There are no local partners who developed this completely throughout his PhD, and he is really looking at hip hip flexion exosuits. So exosuits, what are they? They're soft textile-based orthoses that have um, very few kinematic constraints as opposed to conventional sort of hard robotic systems that are worn. They're highly configurable and they, you know, they, they're, they're comfortable. But because it's form-fitting, it is actually functionally dependent on the form of the user. And so this is the last slide here. Ross is basically looking at how certain characteristics of someone's BMI or their size or their sex their shape itself can be used, information about that, as well as their individualized gait patterns can be used to, sh to predict what are optimal configurations for even an adaptive system, not just a, a completely passive system, how they can be scaled for multiple joints, and how, um, you know, basically, I guess what I'm trying to say is, you know, yeah, designing control of soft exosuits. And so I thank you for your time, and um, if you have questions, feel free to email me or any of the suits. Thank you. Yeah, cool. Thank you, Professor McFay. Last, we are going to have Dr. Ken Alimalach. Uh, yeah. All right. Yeah, I'm a little shorter. Not that short. You okay? Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ken Alimalach. Uh, I'm a postdoc at Price University, uh, working with Professor Lydia Kavraki and Professor Moshe Vardy. Uh, today I'm going to provide a brief overview of uh, the latest line of research that we recently started in the group, uh, which revolves around task and motion planning or how to improve the efficiency of task and motion How to improve the efficiency of task and motion planning by uh, utilizing the notions of abstract skills. Um, and thankfully Lydia has done a great job uh, introducing the task and motion pr planning problem earlier, so we are all already excited and motivated about this uh, topic. Hello? All right. So to get a little more concrete motivation, we can look at the following example, and we can have a, a robot here that uh, operates in this manipulation domain. And we have in this domain three boxes, and we have three cans. And at first, the robot is tasked with uh, stacking the three uh, boxes in this uh, pyramid configuration. And uh, after some intense cal calculations, it manages to find a successful plan to uh, uh, perform the stacking. And later on, we uh, give the robot another task uh, to stack the three cans on the other side of the table. So for a human observer, uh, we can intuitively say that these are two related tasks and that the solutions would be related. But uh, we cannot exactly reuse the same plan that we had beforehand because uh, we need to grasp different objects that might uh, involve different grippings, and we need to also perform it on the other side of the table. So we need to somehow automatically adapt the plan that we had before if we want to reuse it. So the question that we're concerned with is, how can we uh, automatically transfer knowledge from successful solutions of previous tasks to more efficiently solve future tasks? So, um, uh, let us first define what is this knowledge that we want to transfer. So uh, a solution to a task is, a, in this case, a task plan, a discrete plan, right? So it can be represented a sequence of states and actions. So we have initial state, we perform an action, we reach to the next state, and perform an another action, and so on. And typically, when we think of how we can reuse a plan, we think of how we can take the sequence of action and reapply it in another context. But uh, in our uh, in our Work, we realize that it might be more flexible and, and it might be better off by looking at this roadmap of states. So instead of looking at the actions and transfer the actions, we look at a sequence of states and try to transfer those into our new domain. And after I transferred successfully this uh, roadmap of states, I can just, in my uh, destination domain, easily calculate the actions that are uh, required to follow this roadmap. And this is uh, especially relevant for 
for example, we have two robots that have different uh, action set. One robot can uh, uh, pick and place items, and one can only push items. So we will not be able to just take the action set and transfer it. So, but with this technique, we can uh, still take the road wrap and adapt the actions appropriately. So now that we understand what we want to transfer this road wrap, we can understand uh, now how to perform this transfer. So uh, we're doing it uh, using the concept of abstraction keys. Uh, and abstraction keys uh, been recently introduced in our work that's been, uh, will be presented in Wafer uh, later this year. Um, and abstraction keys are generic tools that allow us to automatically adapt and transform states, so the states in the road wrap. Uh, and every abstraction key operates on a, on a specific property of the state. So if our state uh, specifies what type of object we're operating on, then this is a property. If it specifies the location of an object, this is a property. A color, it's a property. So to transfer, to maybe change each one of these properties, uh, we will have a different abstraction key. Uh, and in practice, an abstraction key is based on a pair of parametric functions. So we have a projection function to take the states and remove this property that we are concerned with and takes us to an abstract state. And then we have uh, the inverse function that takes the abstract state and just plugs back in this uh, value that we removed. So we can see here, for example, in the figure we have a state and we have one part of it that is like a color, specifies the color of an object, it's blue. And by going to the abstract state, we just remove the, the color blue. Uh, and then we can return by uh, performing the reconstruction. And this uh, technique provides us with a very systematic and, and, and intuitive way to perform transformation uh, of states to simply remove the property that we are concerned with by applying the projection and then reconstructing with uh, another property. So for example, here I uh, change from blue to red. I will first remove blue and then reconstruct with red. So, and if we are talking about the same example from the beginning that we had boxes and cans, then I can uh, remove the explicit uh, uh, the explicit uh, type of object that it's a box. I will just have an abstract state that talks about any object, and then I will plug back in the can. So this way, I can take a, a, a box stacking plan and transfer it to can stack. So this projection we can. Uh, as I implied, we can just apply it to all the states in the roadmap such that we get an, uh, an abstract roadmap. So every time I successfully solve a skill, solve a, excuse me, successfully solve a task, I can, instead of just uh, saving the plan as it is, I will first project it to an abstract domain, and then I will save this abstract roadmap, and uh, we refer to this abstract roadmap as a skill. And then, once I face a new task, I will just query my library of all the skills that I accumulated and see if any of them can be applied to my new task. What I'm practically asking is, can I take this abstract roadmap and find a parameter to reconstruct it such that this new plan is applicable to my problem? And uh, this uh, technique allows us to uh, avoid domain-to-domain -to -domain, uh, uh, coupling. So we can, we always just save this abstract representation, and even if we have new domains that we have yet to see, we can just reconstruct it appropriately. Okay. All right, so maybe we can uh, uh, get a, a little bit uh, of clear understanding by looking at this uh, illustration, this uh, domain. So we have uh, a discrete grid maze uh, here that represents any discrete planning domain. It doesn't have to be navigation, but we have a start state and a goal state, and we have obstacles, and the solution here is uh, we're looking to find a path from the start to the goal, right? And next to this domain, we have also a, a library of skills that we uh, accumulated from the solutions of previous tasks. So every one of this, it just represents a roadmap, and the abstraction key that we plug in, that we use here, this allows us to take any of these shapes and stretch it and rotate it and, and place it anywhere that we want on the grid. And so as long as I preserve the shape, I can just try to place it on the grid. And this can be done automatically with the abstraction. And what we are asking here is, can I take any of this shape and stretch it or rotate it or adapt it in a way that the both end of the roadmap will align with my starting goal? And 
this means that I managed to match the skill to the starting goal. So we can see here some bad matches. So uh, we took uh, the skills and we can see that some of them only align in the goal state, some of them only align in the, in the start state, some of them hit the obstacles. So these are all bad examples, but it shows how we can adapt the skills that we have uh, as abstract skills and put them on the grid. But actually, we don't need to check all the configurations. We can symbolically, if the value, the right parameters exist, we can find them symbolically. So in this case, if we uh, look at the purple skill, we can see that we were able to find uh, the parameters to match it to our plan. So we can see that we rotated this road map and stretched it out a little bit, and we were able to hit uh, the start, both the start and the goal. So in this case, this is a successful match. And after I've done this, I guess I can just uh, easily uh, plan the sequence of actions that is required to follow this road map. And this will for sure be more efficient than simply blindly searching the space because we have a road map. So this is the general concept. Uh, I try to be uh, not too specific. Here are some ideas that we started to pursue and we uh, uh, will pursue in the future. So taking this idea and putting it in motion planning, so continuous domains, uh, composing skills and roadmap, uh, learning skills, learning abstraction issues, and if, if any of these sounds interesting for you, then uh, you're welcome to talk to me because we're always looking for more people to collaborate with. And actually, right on time, I have two seconds, one second, zero second. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, now, yeah, so because uh, they're still setting out the launch uh, launch out there, so we're going to have the Q&A on Q20, so like uh, including Ken and also David and also Nick, uh, who didn't answer, yeah. So I guess, I, I guess just not Professor. Thanks, Ken, for the really cool talk. Um, I was curious to hear your thoughts on uh, how do you define these properties uh, which you can add and subtract from a concrete plan to abstract them? So uh, for every property that you would like to change, uh, you need a new abstraction. So the abstraction keys themselves need to be designed by a human, but once they are generic, generic enough that you can just design, just choose the property that you want to change. For example, the type of object, the locations, and just have this library of abstraction keys that we can automatically use. So you just need a human to specify which properties can be adapted and then the system can automatically. Okay. I was mostly thinking of uh, how do you define the, how do you come up with the properties, but it sounds like you answered it that the human defines the properties, right? Yes. Okay. So a human define a property and just create an abstraction key for it. What happens if there's something uh, like uh, additional obstacles suddenly like added into the system? Do they like, like all the, is it, you have to replan it in certain so, ways? So that's actually a great question and it actually shows the strength of this method. For example, let's say that uh, we reconstructed the, the purple plan and one of the, uh, the uh, states in the roadmap has, has hit, hit an obstacle. Then we can simply uh, skip this state and follow and uh, plan to the next state. So the roadmaps are adaptable because even if I take uh, take one state off the roadmap, it's still a roadmap. And if it was if I was trying to uh, uh, transfer an action plan, so the action sequence, once one action fails, the rest of the plan is invalid. And in this case, it actually shows. And thank you for the question that uh, we can. Uh, it's more flexible and we can overcome such. Yes. Thank you. Um, Nick, I, I like. Uh, I can answer on their behalf. I <laughs> sorry. Um, I, I like that last project you showed where it was about dynamic systems with parts of the system that are more static than others in the, the way that the, 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 the legging or the wrapping or strapping or whatever you want to call it are wrapped around there. It reminded me of a, a project that you know, Rob probably remembers from NASA with gloves, redesigning gloves. And I recall then it was much more of a, 
you know, just kind of let's play with it, see what happens, kind of deal where they put tape on their fingers and see how the tape changes. Kind of stay static. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, most typically, like even just doing traditional motion capture, you would identify, you know, with reflective markers. Typically, those reflective markers are placed on what we consider to be like bony prominences. So, in the front of the pelvis, the ASIS, PSIS, PSIS um, your hip, your greater trochanter landmarks, things like that are actually, um, you know, relatively uninfluenced by skin motion and things like that. And so when you think about an exosuit, for example, that's why, you know, a waistband, something that, that mounts on the waist is a great idea because it can sort of mount there close to those bony prominences. If there's any sort of excess adipus hangover a little bit, those belts. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that's what you're asking primarily is that right? Yeah. As that, opposed then, to um, sensitivity to different terrains. Yeah. So, so, you know, the, the length of those actuators, um, for example, in a passive case, you could um, just let the hip flexion alone, extension, change the length of that passive actuator, right? Because it's spanning the hip. But then the moment arm that that tension creates about the hip is also a function of the configuration of the hip. Um, and so that's a non-trivial thing on its own. But we are currently investigating sort of non-static proximal and distal attachment points to basically keep systems to be passive but to move them a little bit, right? When the device is unloaded, let's say for certain terrains where you might be able to store that elastic energy due to frontal plane motion, so hip, hip adduction, and then maybe return that elastic energy in the sagittal plane for hip uh, flexion. So we are investigating that, using that system to do that as well. Yeah, yeah, thank you for the question. Okay. Uh Uh, we, we, we have not. There are people who have um, sort of hybrid um, finite, element, uh, finite element models, like kind of multi-scale basically, where you're doing finite element models of, of soft tissue of the foot, the bone within the foot, and then you combining that with rigid body musculoskeletal simulation in a similar way where the models sort of talk to each other, kind of like how we showed in the, the last aim there. Um, so it, it can be done, and typically that's done first with like system identification where you're, you're pushing on certain portions underneath the foot, um, and you're then characterizing stiffness, um, dissipation, that kind of thing, and then informing then your, your finite element model. For, and um, yeah, so people, people have done that for sure. Uh, and that data is out there actually kind of publicly available. People are very interested in feet because of like diabetics, for example and the blood flow within the foot and pressure concentrations that exist on the bottom of the foot. But I think you're asking more from a space perspective, right? Yeah, that's a that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Shape of the femur as opposed to the the distribution of soft tissue. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And one thing I didn't talk about too, but the amputation surgery itself. So how how muscles are anchored, you know, mu muscle lines of action change the way that they're sutured together. Sometimes muscles are sutured to muscles. Sometimes muscles are sutured to bone. Um, and there's different surgical techniques that are associated with that that would change the way that someone can actually act activate their hip. So you think they still have their hip, right? It should be good, but because they've had a surgery, that's all messed up too. And so, but if you have a nice you know, knee and ankle prosthesis, an active system, you could potentially compensate for impairment of the hip. And so that's a question we're interested in as well.
Well, thank you. Thank you so much for the. Cool. Uh, in the interest of time, I suggest that we break for lunch.